Political issues. Okay. Yes. Hello, Shakur and Co. Okay. Ethical, social, and political issues that are raised by information systems. This is just one part. But because of the trends in technology, the development in technology also raises, in itself, also raises some ethical and social issues. And I'll give a typical example. If I have a bunch of photographs on my traditional photo album. And you come, I give it to you, you have a look at it, and you want to sneak a picture out. It is much more difficult than when I give you my phone, to look at a picture, and then you quickly forward it to yourself. So the fact that the technology makes it possible for you to be able to compact data, it makes it raises an ethical problem or a social problem at some level, and sometimes even political problem. So these are some of the things we would look at in this course. Now, there are some specific principles which can be used to guide our ethical decisions. We'll look at some of them, and as a manager, what procedure should we follow to make an ethical decision, not an unethical decision? We'll also try to understand why complementary, uh, contemporary information systems technology and the internet poses a challenge to the protection of individual privacy and intellectual property. If you are using an iPhone here, they will always tell you to get, to get music or tracks, music tracks on your iPhone, you need to go to iTunes and download it. But people have used third party applications to be able to have access to music tracks and not necessarily buying it from what? iTunes. Those who compose the songs, they own the property rights. If it is an ebook, a typical example is what happened at the beginning of this, uh, this course. I indicated that there is a book I will share with you. But the book is expensive, over $50. I didn't buy it. We are not also buying it. We know some rogue websites that we can go to unethically download books free of charge. It means that I am infringing on the intellectual property of the, of the utter. But what is making this possible? Because of the advent of what? The internet. Because those usually this particular site, especially the one I'm using, is by some Russians. So we go then we download. The person has liberty to write the book, but we just take it and use it for, for free. It's haram. <laughs> Why is this thing? Okay. So we we'll also look at how information systems have affected laws for establishing accountability, liability, and the quality of everyday, everyday life. So to start off, I want to use this uh, preamble. Uh, we, often, we often would refer to an information systems and a society. The moment we are discussing information system, we, want, we always want to contextualize it. So if you are looking at IT or information system, for it to be relevant, it must be within the context. So uh, somebody gave an example yesterday about e-levy. And we said, OK, what is the technology? Which context is it? So it is always very important for us. So we say that when technology is introduced into a society or an organization, it would cause a lot of problems. And people will resist it because of changes in the, because of the fact that the technology may not fit the existing job task, the nature of the people, even the nature of the technology itself will cause problems. So we often would say that uh, an organization or a society uh, can be likened to a very calm pond, a pond of water, and the technology can be likened to a pebble or a stone. If you throw a stone or a pebble into a very calm pond of water, what will happen? What would happen? It will create, create waves. So there's a ripple effect. 
This ripple effect cannot be suddenly stopped. And technology, when introduced in an organization or society, behaves this way. People, even if you are using the, the, the concept we looked at yesterday, social shaping involving everybody, some people will still resist. Some, some tasks may not fit. It will take time for things to be what? To be properly aligned. So in discussing the introduction of technology in organization, we often use the concept of the pond and a pebble. So that when you throw a pebble into a pond, it will cause ripple effects. The effects cannot suddenly be stopped. It will take some time before, before it settles. This thing is going to cause me a lot of inconvenience. Now, when I use uh, uh, MTN data, how much does it cost? Uh, maybe one megabyte. It's not the same as how much it will cost with Vodafone. It's not the same. But if I pay twenty, or if I pay uh, say one CD for a megabyte of data, and you also pay two CDs for a megabyte of data, meanwhile we are just accessing the same content. So why should they charge us differently? There's a concept of information systems we refer to as net neutrality. Don't you think it should be the same? Because it's the same uh, access we want to have, but we are being charged differently. Even within the same company, even within the same company, if you are accessing some particular pages during a particular time of the day, your internet charges are different. So they have, they have cost for midnight bundle, they have cost for uh, peak times and periods that are not peak. In that case, the companies are not being neutral to us because it's the same content I'm going, it's just a matter of maybe uh, convenience. I want to access it, but because of that, you are charging me different. We refer to that as net neutrality. Anybody, all of us here use Facebook. We also use Google in different, different respects. The kind of data these particular companies collect from us. Even if we look at the fine print, there are so many ways they are violating our privacy, our rights, without we necessarily know it. In advanced countries like US, Facebook has, they have been invited to face panels and panels and panels just to confirm that, confirm what they are using, the, the kind of data or the nature of the data they are collecting and what they are using it for. Look at it in our developing country context. Nobody cares what they use your data for. Even the way, in terms of even net neutrality, the way the telephones are doing to us, when uh, the MTN zone bundle was, was removed, uh, a lot, some people approached MTN. They said, no, no, it's not our problem. The government said we should do that. And for one reason, the government felt that MTN had a very large, anybody here who works with MTN, they, they are controlling a large part of the market. And they say it is detrimental to the other telephones. How can they ensure that the others also survive? They should increase their tariffs. If they increase their time, maybe people may switch to people may switch. But I have always been one.
are trying hard to ensure that uh, they are trying hard to pay back your money. But in actual fact, they are not doing anything. They are just listen, continuing with the Ponzi scheme they were with. It's not a Ponzi scheme. You agree with it. It's a Ponzi scheme. So they are just continuing with, with whatever they were doing. Okay. So we said that information system raises ethical questions because they create opportunities for intense social change. Let's look at the way we used to interact. If you needed to talk to a friend about 10 years ago, you probably would go to a communication center if, the, if he's far away to make a call because only a few people could afford the, the phone. But today, your friends all over the world, you can bring them on a very simple platform and you can interact every, every minute. So the level of social uh, change, the intensity has changed. Uh, for some of us here, if you go to a bend down boutique to buy an item, you would want to feel the texture of the fabric, wrap the, 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 the trouser or whatever around your neck to ensure that it fits. Compare this to buying things online. If we compare the way our interactions were to how our interactions are now, yesterday we were given an example of a parent who restricts his or her, her children. Look, the intensity of the interactions the child would have, even locked up in a room with a mobile phone, would be more if the child had what? Had gone out. So information systems raises an ethical question about it. Because what happens is that it also threatens the distribution of power. So you are on, you have a kid, you have locked the kid, you can't go anywhere. But somebody is online interacting with the kid and, and instructing the kid to do A, B, C. Influence online can be more than the physical influence. So many of those who are engaged in online businesses, they will tell you even without going out, they are able to make money online because of the intensity of the, the interaction. It also gives us new rights and obligations. But it also presents an opportunity for a very different kind of criminal crime, cyber, yes. So it is helping in intensifying social change and threatening the bureaucracy in the existing distribution of power. But also, people are able to use technology in new ways to commit what? New kinds of crime. There are new opportunities, there are new kinds of crime. This is the example I gave earlier the pond and the ripple effect of throwing technology into an organization. So, okay, I've explained this. So we should always see society as a pond and information technology as a rock which we will drop into the pond. And when we do that, it will create ripple effects of new situations that are not covered by the existing laws. So if we introduce technology in an organization and it creates situations that are not covered by all rules, what will happen? Can anybody give an example of uh, a scenario where information technology was introduced or you individually adopted a technology, but you realize that the way you have been doing things, because of your adoption of the technology, you can't do things that way. Huh? Yeah, letter writing. If you if you don't have an email account, you always and you are an illiterate, maybe an illiterate chief or whatever, you always call your secretary or son. Can you write me a letter. I'm telling you, you know, I'm very 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 But when you now adopt technology, so with, with the first with the traditional way of doing things, private your privacy confidentiality will be compromised because you have to save everything. But if you adopt uh, the technology. It means that your secretary, in a way, is now going to be what redundant. But in the in the chiefdom, the secretary is not supposed to be what. Uh -huh. So the the adoption of the technology may not uh, uh, may create situations that are not covered by by old rules. For us to be able to understand the relationship between these three things: ethical, social, and political issues that information systems raise, our best bet is to rely on this diagram. This diagram, if you look at what is in the middle, information technology and information systems combined, we are saying that throughout this morning, what we have been trying to do is that we are saying that when we introduce information systems or technology in an organization, it raises ethical issues. It raises social issues. It raises political issues. 
But these issues are raised at different, different levels, at the level of the individual, the societal level, maybe the, the organizational level, and maybe the general body politics nationally, too, which may also raise certain issues. But it also has some dimensions, which we refer to as the moral dimensions. One typical example of the moral dimensions would be property rights and obligations. So if I have uh, composed a song, I own the copyright. If you steal it, you are, yeah, so it raises some kind of property rights here. And your obligation as uh, a citizen, should you still, should you involve in some issues that raises, uh, uh, defeats your moral upbringing or background. Then the issues of system quality, our quality of life, how has the information system changed your quality of life as an individual? How has technology changed your quality of life as an individual? Uh, so be specific, the way you were doing, like the way you were interacting, connecting with people has changed. The way you were communicating has changed. Even the way we are in, in some five, 10 years ago, there was an uproar in the educational, in higher education. Anybody who had a PhD, an online PhD or master's, you had a serious problem. Today, look at what we are saying. We are arguing that fiscal space is not a barrier for higher education. And everybody is cool with that. <laughs> so all over the country, <laughs> many universities are adopting this online, online means. It is changing our quality of life. It also raises the issue of accountability and control, information rights and obligations. So what we are going to do from now on will be to look at all these issues. That is what is going to guide our discussion going, going forward. So the first one is the information rights and obligations. And all of them come with some questions which should make our, our lecture very interactive. The first one is, what information rights do individuals and organizations have with respect to themselves? What rights have you got with respect to the information that you keep on your phone? What rights have you got? You have the right not to share that information with what? With anybody, privacy. Now you have agreed that somebody else and have access to that information and share it with third party. Basically, that's what you have done, what you did when you signed up to this particular app. And it raises a moral, a moral issue. What can you do to protect it? So physically, you can keep it under lock and key. But because of the introduction of technology, it creates situations that are not covered by, you can't put, how do you put this under lock and key? Password it. Are you getting it? So the traditional way of, Keeping your data safe has also what has changed. But we say it raises a moral dimension because you have signed up to the fact that those who have access to the, your data, they can share it with what? With third parties. Hmm? You can keep it under lock and key. But you have signed up to the fact that they can keep it, they can share it with other, other third parties. Sorry. Okay. Then the issue of property rights and obligations. How will traditional intellectual property, so talking about intellectual property, somebody has written a book and owns the rights to that particular book. We sell it up to some point and maybe decide to make it free of charge. But we go and we download it free of charge. Is there a moral issue there? What I have been doing this for God knows how long. As long as I have been teaching this course, I have been sharing books with students free of charge. I aspire to also write books. So when I write books and somebody shares it, you see that it will raise a moral issue because the, the effort, the investment I would have made into this asset would be what? I will not get the, the returns on my investment. Accountability and control. Who can and who would be held accountable and liable for the harm done to us, who would be held liable if Facebook's uh, agreement to the fact that you protect my data and only share it with specific companies for, for advertising purposes? If Facebook is compromised, uh, BlackBerry, or oh, sorry, this, what app were you, what phone company did you mention? 
uh, BlackBerry, data breaches, who would be held responsible? The company, but they will also argue that they put in ABC procedures and so they are not liable. And maybe you also didn't keep your password or users didn't adhere to certain principles. So there's always a puzzle when we are dealing with the moral dimensions of the information age. Then we have system quality. What standards of data and system quality should we demand to protect individual rights and safety of society? So if I am using an app, what features do I need to see to ensure that the quality of this system can be guaranteed? So that when I'm using it, my data will not be compromised. Yes. Okay, yeah. They didn't, de they didn't detect. Mm -mm. You can't. Can you, you understand what it's saying? There's a body that regulates, say, Facebook. I get it. And you are the user. So there are three parties here the regulator, the organization, and the consumer. Uh -huh. So you have signed up to this to the organization Facebook, and Facebook agree, oh, they will protect you and whatnot. But because of your laxity in protecting your own uh, passwords and whatnot. Okay. Oh, then Facebook is liable. The organization is what is liable. You can. Mm. The the. Be another body. A regulatory body, I get that. Okay. Can the individual sue them? Ah, it depends on your muscle. <laughs> <laughs> you can. You can. You can sue the regulatory the regulatory body. Just let's just look at it now. If it is in an, in an, adva in an advanced economy, you can easily do that. Even without necessarily, you just there will be other regulators. Who are in charge or government agents who are in charge of the regulator, and you can report. In our context, FDA, just look at F, what FDA is doing. And then you, yeah. FDA, in the case of the regulatory body, you want to take FDA on. Everybody in the country will say that you are not serious. Uh, but you can actually do that if the systems work in a particular society, if they work. So, as an individual, what values should be presented in an information and knowledge-based society to preserve your quality of life and your use of an app? Which institutions should we protect from violation? Which cultural values and practices does the new information technology support? If we're looking at the quality of life, these are some of the questions we can ask ourselves. Now, I started by indicating that considering the trends in technology, it may raise ethical issues. Storage is one. The mobility of devices is also another, another example. Many of us would have uh, used the hunchback computers 15, 20 years ago. In some organizations, you still find them. Let's just look at stealing that particular hunchback monitor. The difficulty you would have as opposed to just stealing a flat screen. So because of that portability, it raises an, an ethical issue. We have been talking about ethical, ethical. When we say something has to do with ethics, what do we mean? Ethics means what? Right the issue, yes. The issues of right and wrong. Now, there's this rule that says that uh, when you are dealing with technology or the growth of technology, the power of computers doubles every one and a half years. The first laptop you had, the, or the first desktop you had, or the first mobile phone you had, the speed of it. I remember the first desktop I had, the, the, the hard disk alone was just one, one point something, 1 1.5 gig or so. The processor, I can't even mention it. <laughs> but today, just a mobile phone would have a processor, the speed far, far, 10 times or 20 times better than yes. Data storage costs is in rapid decline. When pen drives 
USB drives came, people used to hang them on their chest. Yeah, they would wear them <laughs> as part of some trend. Uh, anybody here who can remember the, the size, the, the capacity of the first pen drive you owned? Yeah, it started with 256 megabytes. Even 128, eh? 128, 256 megabyte, 512, then one gig. Those who had the one gig, they were those wearing them. One gig. But now you can have 16, 16, 64, the terabyte. The terabyte means 1,000 gig. You can store almost everything we have, we have here. Now, because of the, the decrease in storage cost, even with the use of hard uh, physical pen drive now, you can decide not to even have it. You can store everything using uh, online storage. If you are using iPhone, you can use cloud, iCloud. If you are using Google, Google Drive, you can use OneDrive, Dropbox. Because of this, even let's just restrict ourselves to the decline in the cost of the fiscal storage. And you see that it raises ethical issues. You know the big hard drives, we used to carry them in our bags with external drive. Yeah. Somebody stealing that as opposed to somebody just stealing an SD card. Very small. Because of that compatibility, it raises the issues of theft. It's very easy to conduct. Then these days too, technology has made it possible for us to be able to, uh, to be able to do analysis, advanced analysis. Yesterday we, 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 we looked at the concept of business intelligence. Yes, the ability for us to rely on data analysis tools to come up with hidden trends in data and an organized data data which is disaggregated. We can come up with some trends in it. There are advances in technology and it also raises a lot of uh, moral issues. Then network, uh, networking advances. The way we are able to connect with each other also raises a lot of moral and ethical issues. These days, it is difficult to just, uh, assuming you, you want to put, uh, stop somebody from talking to somebody. In those days, you could just say, look, as for these people, we don't interact with them. Their cycle don't go there. If you try to restrict a child from such interactions, you can just use, connect with people on Facebook, Twitter, and many, many other social. And yesterday we gave the example of physically stopping people from hook up, as opposed to you rather trying to consent, con uh, change their conscience so that they will not engage in that activity. Otherwise, they can just be in their rooms, sign up to apps like Tinder, and many other apps. And then they will do whatever they want to do and even make more money as compared to if they were to come and stand by the, by the roadside. Mobile device growth and its impact. It is because of mobile device growth that has enabled activities like mobile payment services. I know one big man who always maintained that he has no mobile money account. Why? Because he feels that it raises some moral issues. When people come asking for money, he can no longer say, I don't have. They will say, oh, send it to me by mobile money. And he says, he always maintains that he doesn't operate a mobile money account. Now, one other uh, important thing in terms of, we're tying this particular point to the third one, data analysis advances. If you go to a shop to buy an item, I'm not sure if any of the shops around here they do that. A shop can give you a card. A sign, they can ask you to sign up for a shop card. Malcolm does that. But uh, I'm not sure it explains, it will explain quite well what I want to say. When you use the card, you get a discount, right? Are you aware that they are able to store your pages, your, the history of your, your pages? So it means that they can tell your buying behavior. They can predict your buying behavior. For them, I think the, the, the import of them giving you the card is to give you the discount. But they could go to engage in some advanced data analysis techniques to predict your buying behavior. So you come to the shop, you have a card, and they realize that when you buy a particular product, you buy another product together. Now, if they analyze their data and they realize that most often, when people buy this item A, they also buy item B. But you see that Malcolm, they have, an under, they have a ground floor and an upper floor. Item A is on the ground floor. Item B is on the upper floor. 
because of advances in technology, they may be able to predict that well. People always buy this together. So there is no point in shelving. The decision to shelve items or arrange items would have to be shaped by the advances in what? In the data analysis. So they will, not, they will now say that for customer's convenience, and because of the evidence presented to us by the data, let's now bring the items that are upstairs to closer to the ones that are. That, so even with our corner shops, we engage in some kind of mind games. When you, are, you have your shop and people come, they buy bread and then they buy milk. So when the uh, bread is just usually at the, at the entrance, the counter, and then they are looking for milk and they say it's at the back. They go to the bank and they say, where is it? Where is it? And they, you see them maybe either puffing or making some remarks. Ah. Then you realize that, look, to ensure customer convenience, bread, milk, it goes together. Tea is also there. So when they buy, they may even be tempted. Oh, why not just buy? And you can even use that as an advertising opportunity. Oh, you bought bread. Can you buy some sugar? <laughs> buy this. But if it is disaggregated, the display is not arranged in a way. But with advances in technology, it is easier for us to use business intelligence tools to be able to predict trends in, in, our, in our data. It also means that there could be some hidden trends that people can discover from your data and they use it against you. And that is where the issue of ethics will come. We are just looking at, we're just looking at the positive aspect, but people could also use it against you. Long time ago, Nigerians were very much interested in hard drives. So when used computers come and they are buying them and they also buy, they are not buying to go and use. They are just buying and they will take the hard drive, try and use some softwares to see. Well, if you didn't format, if the white guy didn't forgot to, or the company, they forgot, they didn't format it. They will just try to recover the data in there. If the one who was using it had an online bank account, they may be able to use the browser, existing browser on, on it, or use some app to be able to figure out the passwords. They will try and log in. So hard drives were a hot kick. So it raises ethical issues there. And data, and advances in data analysis techniques is also used in an advanced way to uh, track criminals. To track criminals. If you have been into documentary, it, it will not amaze you how US used data to be able to track down Osama bin Laden. Yeah, just a phone call, they, they were able to trace and know exactly where he is. So we are saying that when we have large amounts of data, large amounts of data, we can use advanced data analysis techniques to, to figure out some, some non-obvious relationship. And we're saying these trends are non-obvious because the human, uh, the human mind is not able to what, do that analysis and come up with that. So profiling, non-obvious relationship awareness or NORA, basically refers to combining data from multiple sources to find hidden connections or trends that might help identify criminal behavior, criminal behavior. So even when you are, you are no longer interested in using your old phone, the best is not just to dash it, give it out to somebody. You have to make sure that every little bit of information that is there should be what? Should be deleted, should be deleted. Many marriages, many relationships, people have, been robbed just because they sent their mobile phones to a repair shop. Yes, they sent it to a repair shop. So a typical example of a non-obvious relationship awareness is this. Somebody can be a criminal and the police may put the person on a watch list. Huh? So the watch list, because the police service or the security service, they are sharing data with the airport. If the criminal goes to the airport with the passport, to leave the country, they will be able to access that database and maybe an alert will be triggered and they will be able to get that person. Then we also have incident and arrest systems. In town these days, many joints or junctions, you would see CCTV cameras. Yeah, the CCTV cameras can be linked to the database. There's, there's a control center. If something happens in town, you are tracing, you can go there. Customer transaction systems, Melcom, all what we buy, the cards, everything is put on there. 
in some advanced countries, your card, anything you buy, they will give you points. Apart from a discount, they will give you a point. When you accumulate the points to some level, you can use the points to even buy something in the shop. But as interesting as this may seem, they are not giving you the item free of charge. They are just collecting data of you. Because you also want more points, you will always come back to buy. So the more points you get, the more data they, they, they are able to gather, and the more they will be able to identify some of your buying behavior and save you with the right advert or the right product. Then telephone records. <clears throat> are you aware that MTN, you can use an SSD code and download a statement of your phone records from one period to the other? Are you aware? Yes. You will just dial the SSD code. They will ask, they will want to they will confirm your date of birth, confirm some details, and then you enter the date range and your email address. And MTN will send you all the course, call records, incoming and outgoing calls. So if I want to track the, the late night calls you have been making, <laughs> and I have access to your phone, I, I, I don't need to hardly try to use the, the call records on your phone to find the, the, the through, using through caller to find who you have called. I will just enter it. I know your date of birth, of course, we know each other. I know, I know your email address, but I won't use that email address. I'll just put in my email address and put the phone down. Five minutes, I get an attachment, several pages, all the calls you have made. <laughs> in organizations, the HR department, the HR department will always try to do due diligence to find out the nature of the candidate they are recruiting. Yes, we we'll call the referees. They will try to trace your work history, your employees, what has happened over the years. Assuming there was a centralized database that the organizations have to subscribe, they can just enter your date of birth and all your work history will be there. So all of this can be aggregated in a way so that uh, trends that would have been very much hidden can be made obvious for, for decision making. So assuming you are a manager, you are confronted with an, with an, an ethical dilemma. When I say ethical dilemma, we said ethics has to do with the issue of what right and wrong. So you are not sure what should you do? How will you conduct the ethical analysis? before you, pick, you make a decision as a manager. So look at these five things. We may have been doing them already. Identify and clearly describe the facts. What facts are you confronted with? This is in line with our, the, the, one of the first concepts we looked at on Monday, the systems theory. Remember, we said, as a manager, always think of things in a holistic, yes. So identify and clearly describe the facts. Define the conflict or the dilemma. What is actually the problem? Define the conflict or dilemma and identify them. You prioritize them in terms of higher order values. Then who is affected? Yes. So they tell you, he has said this about you, and then you say, write a query or sack him. There are a lot of stakeholders engaged here. Work may come to a standstill. Maybe this guy you are going to get fired. All the password, all the stuff in your organization, he handles them. He leaves your systems are compromised. Identify the options that you can reasonably take so that the effects would be. Remember, you would have uh, identified, uh, defined the conflict and prioritized them. Then you identify who is affected, and then the options will be based on what the higher order values you have, you have placed on them. Then the last one, what will be the effects of your decision, the consequences of your options? Uh, we have been doing a lot of this without knowing that we are going through some, some ethical analysis. Okay. Apart from the, the five step process, to conduct ethical analysis. There are also some principles that should always guide our ethical behavior. Some of these principles are everyday principles. They are everyday principles. One of 
One is a golden rule. The golden rule is that you should do things to others. Yeah, as you have them do with you. And I keep using this example. I give you my phone to look at a picture. Look at the picture and give me back my phone. <laughs> don't scroll left and don't scroll right. Just look. Yes. Then we also have the Kant's categorical imperative. If an action is not right for everyone to take, it is not right for anyone. So as a manager, ethical behavior. You say nobody should use uh, the employer's time, the organization's time to watch or to, to, to engage in some social media, online social media activity. And anytime the secretary comes in, you are watching uh, the, the last episode of a particular, I mean, it doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. Because if you are doing it and everyone did it, the organization or the, the, the society will not work, will not survive. Then also we have the slippery slope. If an action cannot be taken repeatedly, it is not right to take at all. If you have been compromising an organization information system for your personal gain, anytime they are going to make payments, you and the IT guy, you have configured the system in such a way that one city is deducted from somebody and sent somewhere. Yeah, you cannot, you cannot be doing it. You cannot be doing that. And I, I honestly believe that, I don't have evidence, but I believe within me that some banks, microfinance institutions, and maybe even the telecos, they have a way of taking some peanuts from us without what are we knowing? And because of the because of the way the regulatory authorities are, they are not able, they don't even have the systems to be able to detect. Many a time we complain that it, it's happening at Access Bank. So let's be careful about mentioning the IT manager, the, the pest waste. He was transferring it. Wow. An individual was doing it. Wow. A staff. Not a teller, the IT guy. Uh, you know, the teller wouldn't have that, that access and the capacity to be able to do that. Yes, yeah, so you can imagine one, uh, even 50 persons. When was the last time you took your bank statement? From your bank? Nobody takes a bank statement. So even when you get an alert that uh, one city has been deducted, one city is even five cities has it. You won't go to the bank to find out. But those of us, we get it. Yes, yeah, so assuming somebody does that to 1,000 customers on a daily basis. Yes. So there, there may be more than once in the system than we can, we can imagine. Yes, then there's a principle of utilitarianism. Take the action that achieves the higher the higher or greater value. Remember that when we are doing ethical analysis, we have to prioritize in terms of the higher order values. It is based on what? This utility principle. There's, the, the opposite of the utility principle is the risk aversion principle. You do things that will bring you the least harm. Okay, all of this, we know them in daily lives to guide. The Nigerians will tell you that if, if you have traveled to a different place, they will always tell you that there's no free lunch, especially in London. They will tell you there's no free lunch in London. So they accommodate you, give you all the courtesies, and you think, oh, these guys are nice and all that. Ghanaians do that a lot too. At the end of the month, when the bills come, especially if you are using their accounts to, their accounts to work, they will deduct everything and tell you that there's no free lunch. So in a society, we should, not, we should never assume that things are just there free of charge for us to use. There are always rights and obligations. The assumption that virtually all things, they are owned by someone. You pick it and use it at your, at, without consent at your peril. Okay. Now, in our various organizations, what are the professional codes of conduct? I belong to the IC, Institute of Chartered Accountants. There are certain things if you do as a chartered accountant, you are in trouble. Those into medicine. There are certain things if you do it, because they have a professional code of conduct. If you go against the professional codes of conduct, 
will be dealt with. So to, all these things are there to guide ethical behavior, ethical behavior in organization. Anybody who belongs to an institution apart from this, all these entities promise that they will regulate their members to behave in ethical manner. Hmm? It's not. <laughs> it's not true. No. Ah, Ghana Medical Association. There are certain things if you do, they will delist you. <laughs> they, they don't they don't meet it so the the idea behind the idea behind this just a minute the idea behind this is to emphasize the fact that the existence of these professional bodies which set up professional codes of conduct. The main reason behind it is to do what? Guide ethical behavior. Just make sure that the issues of right and wrong are properly what? guided. But arguably, we can say that there are many of these associations that some of the crimes they are, they are conducting, the least said about this, the, the better. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Mm. They are code of conduct here. Yeah. Yes. As uh, academic, for now, I will refer to you as academics. As academics, when you are doing an assignment, I think the first day I mentioned it, don't go and use artificial intelligence do your work. It's just an example of the code of conduct. It's an example of a code of conduct. So using that particular, that, that particular technology, the ethical issues it raises, the assignment we, I gave out, are you aware that if you just go step by step, eh, each guideline and put it into uh, a, a language management uh, tool, like chat GPT, bad, it will answer all the questions for you. Are you aware? It will answer everything for you. What ethical issues are raised by that? Okay, plagiarism. Plagiarism. Okay. The issue, AI has also generated uh, a lot of controversy in terms of we classifying what AI has been able to generate for us as plagiarism. Who, is it for? who, are, who are you copying from? So technologies originally designed to detect plagiarism are struggling to detect texts that are generated. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? So turn it in, for instance. Typically, if you copy from another text, then it detects that you have copied. The text you have, to so and so percentage is similar to this person's text. Are you getting it? But AI picks it from different, different, and then it changes it in a way that even the human mind sometimes is difficult to comprehend. So it is not actually copying ditto, ditto, ditto from another person. We'll, we'll look at a, a practical example of that. So if you put it into such a technology to detect plagiarism, will it detect it? It won't detect it. So in order to address this unethical behavior by academics, they have come up with a component to detect whether the text is generated by AI. So the issue of classifying AI-generated content as plagiarized content is debatable. You understand what I'm saying? It's debatable. Anybody here who relies on that in a work setting, you're, you are a secretary, you are a manager, your boss says, go and write a memo for so and so. The times of you going to sit and think hard about what you write is gone. If you are still doing that, you are wasting your time.
to less than a minute. Can you? Hmm? That's the name. On your mobile phone, you can do that. It's, this is long. We won't, we won't go through that. But this is a, just an example of, could be an example, a perfect example of an, an ethical behavior, especially if it is in an academic setting. So these days, this is what happens. And I want you to know for a reason. When we allocate you a supervisor and you are supposed to write your thesis, and you go and somebody says, you don't have time, I'll do it for you and charge you 2,000. He's going to rely on this. So your supervisor says, so he will, it doesn't matter the topic. It, this thing will write the dissertation for you. It will write a full dissertation. Uh, your supervisor will say, go and bring chapter one or proposal. The contractor will put it there, each section. So it depends on, so what we, we say is that you see the, message he put here. The message is called a prompt. So he'll be giving the prompt bit by bit. So you can give, so if you look at the way the term paper is structured, you can just say it should write the introduction. Include so and so in the introduction. And it will write the introduction, one page. So you copy and go and put. Write background. Think of a problem and write the problem for me. Then the next one you say, Identify a technology that addresses this that problem. It will write, and you'll be copying them. So if it is a thesis or dissertation or whatever, the moment the topic is concluded, this can write the introduction. It can identify the problem. It will give you the objectives. It will give you the questions. Significance of everything. So that person who is going to collect your money will do this. If your supervisor is somebody who is not technologically literate, he will say, wow. But what we are going to do in this course is that when we allocate you supervisors, we will give each of you a turn it in account. That even if you have given your work to a contractor and the contractor brings it back, you will put it inside and it will detect. Are you, are you getting it? So the university has also paid for this software to detect cheaters. Yes. So this is academic. Now our work, our topic is not really necessary about concentration on academia. Your work environment. How do you rely on technology to improve it in an ethical way? So memo, uh, Muda, write a memo for us. Where do you work? Anybody who wants to write a memo or leave memo? Your English is not so good. Re write a memo to HR manager asking for uh, a one month leave to undertake my sandwich program in UDS from 21st August to October 2nd. So from 21st, any date, just put any date, August to September, the 20th of September. So HR money, okay. So uh, give it another prompt. Explain how important this course is to my group and the benefit of the organization. Okay. Stambik, write a memo to HR manager of my organization. Then he has put Stambik Bank, Bank Ghana, asking for leave to attend MSC sandwich program from 25th August to 20th September. Emphasize the importance of the sandwich program in the memo. Enter. Okay, so look carefully. It says your name. 
your employer ID, your department, Stambik Bangana, dates. Then two, HR manager, HR, HR manager's name, HR manager, Stambik Bangana, HR manager's email, you put it there. Then say subject, because it understands that a memo must have what? So subject, request for leave to attend MSC sandwich program. Dear HR manager, then you put the name there. I hope this message finds you well. I'm writing to formally request a leave of absence from my duties at Stambik Bangana, commencing on 25th of August and concluding on 20th of September to attend an MSC sandwich program. I kindly seek your approval and support for this temporary leave. The MSC sandwich program is of utmost importance to my professional development and aligns with Stambik Bank's commitment to continuous learning and excellence. I would like to highlight the significance of this program and its potential benefit to both me as an employee. When your money, HR manager is, you say, wow. Yeah. Mm. Excellent. He's raising an, he's raising an issue that he's afraid of the disadvantages. Look, this is a free version. There's a paid version, $20 a month. And what, what it can do is mind boggling. I'm telling you that if you pay the $20 a month, what you can do with it is mind boggling. Even presentations, PowerPoints, videos. So on TikTok, have you been seeing people sharing videos and there's a graphic representation of somebody talking? They didn't sit to design it. Though. They just ask a tool like this to do it. So what they do is they look for why sayings. Give me 20 why sayings of so, so and so. And then they will list it. And then if it's a paid version, they can ask the chatbot to do it using those why sayings in a video. And the video should be of an old man old woman, somebody. And then if you do it, you will save the videos and come to it. So they use that to do what? To make money by relying on what? This chat box. They are called, the general name for them is chat bot. Generally, they are chat bots. We all know chat. Uh -huh. A bot is a robot, robotic technology. Uh -huh. So if you, any question? I'll give you an experience of how I have finally uh, used this with my kids. They gave them an assignment, JHS, and they were asking me, I can't remember exactly what it was. And they said they took my phone to Google. And I said, and they weren't get, getting the answer. And I said, okay, let's use this. So I opened it and we put it there. And they said, ah, but what is, what is that? The answer is writing. And I said, yes. Then it wrote out there. And I said, go and copy. <laughs> and leave me alone because I didn't actually want anything. I said, go take it and go and copy. And they went and copied and came back. Then I was just playing it with, further playing it with, with them. And I said, so so and so doesn't like to wash dishes. Can you suggest how I can deal with this? My, my 11 year old daughter who doesn't like to wash dishes, to wash clothes, how do I deal with it? And it gave examples of how I could deal with it. And I indicated that, in fact, I would prefer to cane. Uh, and then the chat changed from this color to red and said that Chad even doesn't tolerate the abuse of <laughs> So this one is a mind on its own. That's why it's called artificial. Then it says it doesn't tolerate it. I got a bit scared because it was raising an ethical issue there. You know, some of these things can report you because before you use it, you have to log in. So I was like, mm. They may say that this account I'm using, I'm abusing children. So I quickly stop the chat. So even when you are bored, you, can, you are bored, you can engage in a chat with this in any area. So I have a question, maybe a religious question, Islam, Christianity, instead of asking a pastor, I just ask it. What is your view on so and so hadith? It will bring it, quote the Quran, bring different kinds of hadith. But there is a problem. It is not 100% right because it is what? Artificial. 
it is artificial. So people have devised means to query it further. When you give it the prompt, you ask it. Can you confirm that you understand my question? Muda, just type it. Can you confirm you understand the memo you have written? Can you confirm you understood the prompt before writing the memo? Can you confirm you understand the prompt? Before writing the memo, yeah, enter. Certainly. I understand the prompt. You have asked for a memo addressed to the HR manager of Stambic Bank, requesting a leave of absence to attend an MSC service program. Today. The emphasis should be on So it means it understands. There are instances it will tell you, no, no, no. Because, and if you don't ask whether it understands, it, it will give you false answer. Especially if you are dealing with academic text, like if the contractor doesn't know how to use it well, and is looking for references, this thing, it will just be faking references and be given to it because it can't find. Also remember that because it is a model, it is based on some existing what? Data. So it is picked and the data is updated up to a particular point. So if something is very recent and the data it is using is not part of it, it will lie. It will just lie and lie and lie and lie. Okay. That is not to say that any assignment they give you run camp to this place. <laughs> yes. Mm. Mm. AI, yeah. Okay, see. Another app. So it's, it's inbuilt. Yeah. So, yes, so if you have the paid versions, some plugins can be integrated with your WhatsApp. And as you are even chatting with somebody, you could be chatting with somebody, time will come. You could be sending somebody a message and he will be sleeping, but your, the phone will be what? The phone will be responding to your messages. Because of the previous messages, the phone will just respond, respond to them. In a, in a work environment, I highly encourage you explore, you explore this, especially when it comes to writing your report. You have undertaken an activity in your organization. You can just draft the report, skeletal points, or minutes of meetings. You are in a meeting, your boss says, write, you should take the minutes today from this person. Just highlight the points. And when you go and sit down in the comfort of your room, just say, write the minutes of the meeting. These are the points. You'll be amazed at the grammar you, you write for you. Last week, a colleague of mine had a meeting and we supported him to use some other tools apart from this. And then later when he finished the meeting, he came back and told me that, oh, don't shine your own. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And a lot of managers don't know this. A lot of secretaries don't, don't know this. In fact, if you have a secretary and you are conversant with this, your secretary will never write your memo again. Yes, your secretary, you will always write and say, print this. You will just write and say, you, because you just enter what you want to do, the instruction, and it will be drafted. You copy and put it into Word, email to the secretary. Can you put it on letterhead? Then it won't be long. People in the organization will say that, oh, manager is on another level. And I think it is important for us when we go back to work after this program or after, or, well, even after this session, people should start seeing that you have gone back to school. This petty, petty, petty things. Yes. Yes. And I always tell people, look, this is a secret. Don't tell them you are using this one. <laughs> they will say, I hear you. And you know our setting. Huh? They, won't, they won't applaud you for learning this and telling them. Anytime you now write a beautiful memo or report, they will now say that, I, but I, what do you do? I'm not going to stop it. 
but you didn't also know. So some of, some sometimes we don't expose everything. They'll tell you, how did you do it? And they say, oh, I just use word. Meanwhile, you know that you, did, you didn't use word. Yes, I'm coming back to a point you raised about the dangers of relying on, on these technologies. About the dangers of writing, on, writing or using, depending so much on these technologies. And this is just one way. There is a competition out there between tech companies to come up with the best one. Every day, every day. So to the extent that even if you are going to write your dissertation and you have gone to the library, you have access to the UBS uh, resources and you have downloaded several articles, 15 pages, 10 pages, 15 pages. There are platforms you can just drag the PDF and put it inside and say, summarize it. And to summarize it into maybe half a page. It to summarize it to half a page. If you put, pick the half a page here, pick the half a page here, and you put it in this and say, make sure this is what? Coherent or consistent. It will join it. We are interested in letting you know this because it won't be long. The contractors who write thesis for people, they will come here. They will come and pretend as if they are also part of you and they will sit in after break, they will start interacting with you. So wait, to this time, this is how we're going to do it. So we have been doing this. They will let us, the lecturers know. We have been doing this and we can do it for you before we, and then you will fall for it. 2005, 3000, 2005. So they will, they will go and rely on these things. If you do that, we will catch you. That one there. You will be able to detect. So even if you are going to do that, you should be at an advanced level to be able to detect it when the contractor, the contractor brings it. We believe that when we empower you even with these tools, it is also part of the learning because your ability to be able to use turn it in, your ability to be able to rely on these things are all part of the, the learning, learning process. He's taking, he's taking it to another level. <laughs> that you can also let it write. In fact, that is an intelligent way of doing it. Yeah, you can ask it. So your supervisor says, you go and suggest topics for me to consider. Go, go, go there and you are working in a local assembly or you are working in a bank. And you think you should, you should write something about customer service. You should write something about mobile money. Just put the words there and ask it, can you suggest three topics around mobile money services in Ghana? It will suggest it for you. And then you can pick the one you like and maybe add a case study of Stambic Bank, a case study of Commercial Bank, a case study of so and so, MTN. Add it and give it to your supervisor. It is better than you giving it to somebody to use it and write, suggest the topics for you for 100 CDs, 200 CDs. And you pay for it again. So at that level, we are not really bothered about whether it is copy work because it's just a topic. But when it comes to the content and you, I'm, I'm coming to what you ask, when it comes to the actual content and it writes it for you and you now sit down to read it and you change it into your own words, that's where the learning takes place. Are, are you getting it? So you, it can write it for you and you now change it into your own words because you have to read it to make sure that you understand. Unfortunately, there is a tool that does that one. <laughs> Changing it into your own words. There's another paraphrasing tool that can do that one too. Yes, in word. It will just change it. So because of this one, making it computerizing this, there are apps that are called, there are one particular one is called human one. You will just, pick the text from here and put it in there and say it should change it to a human form. You know, this one is not human. So when you put it in turn it, it will say that it's computer generated. So you now put it into another software and say it should change it into human form. That contractor knows that if he brings this one, we will detect. So they will use another software, change it into, so that when we put it into the turn it, it will 
assume that or it will think that a human being wrote it and it will pass. Hmm? Uh, you are asking, no, no, no. There are many of them. Yeah, if you just Google, you will see them many. Even these ones, this one of the most popular ones, Google uses this. Google bad. There are many. And there are many platforms that will change this one into what? Human form. But this is AI. It will change it as if you actually, you actually did that. It is no longer considered so much as cheating. Because that is the trend. I bet there is an academic who doesn't rely on chat GPT. If there is an academic who does that, it means he doesn't just know how to work. To rely on it. But it can shape your, your understanding and your learning faster than if you were to go and sit down and, and, and do a lot of things. This one. No. This one was just to show, you know, it's not actually part of the course. But we are just looking at the ethical aspects of technology. And we are using this one as a case study. But uh, when, when we do our research methods for your presentation, then maybe we can take you through that properly. But at least this session is even enough. If we, we can't teach you everything about it. You have to explore on your own. Even just knowing that it can do it is enough. Explore. Ask it to write anything, and it will write it for you. But if your child comes from work, homework, write myself, and you will say write myself for sense. So, the myself it will write it will not be it will match <laughs> it will match okay wait it's almost two o'clock it's almost two o'clock no, so how come come away yes yes This uh, AI. Yeah. 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 Mm. Okay. Okay. Mm. Yes. Mm. Encouraged. Uh, in terms of this and skills, let me approach it from this way. In terms of the use of this kind of technologies and skills building, or yeah, reliance on labor per se, if it is not used well, it would it, it actually dampens improvement in skills. If it is over relied on, it will dampen your your writing skills. So it means it means that if you are an academic or a student and you rely so much on AI. In fact, on your own, you will not be able to construct a proper sentence. Are you getting it? But if you are the type of student or the type of worker who understands the fact that I need ideas from this to be able to actually move or develop further ideas. Initial ideas, very important. And for me, that's what I use it for. When I'm struggling with thinking through something, then I ask for ideas from it. But doing the work should be conserved. I should be the one doing the work. But the leads, that's why I indicated that, for instance, if you are asked to bring topics, you know, that thought generating process is very difficult because the topic is going to shape the rest of your trimester, the project work. And it's good that you think through it carefully. So you may be thinking about concepts. How are you going to lead them? Difficult for you. So you ask for ideas. 
then when the topics are given, you are able to shape it in a way. But if I do that and I wait, because Chat GPT wrote the topic for me, and I go back and let it write everything, I pick everything, take it into another one, another app to humanize it. What have I learned? Learning will be zero. So you finish the program, you have the skill set you were supposed to actually get out of the program, you have got nothing. I get so in the economy. If you look at it from one breath, you may have been productive during your MSc, but when you go back to the workplace, productivity is actually going to be what? Dampened. So it depends on the way you use it, and you have to use it very carefully. You can be, you, you can be heavily relying on this, and people will not know that that's what you are using. But anytime there's an idea, you are on point. They ask you to speak to it, you can speak to it. So you are going for a meeting or a workshop, and the workshop is around some teams. You can ask ChatGPT to tell you the trendy or contemporary issues that are being discussed with respect to that team. So it will tell you the recent things. That, so you, you arm yourself with that. So when you go and they ask for ideas, you raise up your hand. You have points to what to explain. That will distinguish you from your colleagues. But if they say write a paper and you go and let chat GPT write the whole paper and you go and submit. That is where the problem is. So it depends on how you use it. But the control of its use is not there. Especially in a workplace environment. In academia, the control is the turn it in or the technology to detect. But in a workplace environment, it's not there. So I think that that banner that said that chat GPT com complete this building was to start or engineer some thought process that it is not everything that that technology can do. Because child users cannot complete a building. Are you getting it? So it was just supposed to re... Well, yeah, 3D, yeah, printing. No, no, even, even apart from that, printing. There are these large-scale printers that can be used to print even a car. A car. So even apart from manufacturing the bits and pieces, you just use AI, generate a, a particular model of a car, get the materials, and get a printer. Uh, somebody in Wa, uh, Muda, your man, he, pr he printed a cup for me. A, a, a cup. And the there are technologies even in Tamale to do that. They can print a bag for you. Yes, a bottle and all those things. So we'll get there. Yes. 3, 3D printers can even print a house. Yeah, it's, it's getting crazy and crazier. Yes. Hmm? So the assignment, just use it to guide you. <laughs> just use it to guide you. Okay. So for this particular, this is one of my favorite case study areas, especially for this particular class a case study on ethical use of AI. And then you answer, you read an answer in an exam. Any question? Tomorrow is Friday. I think we should have a break tomorrow. Hmm? <laughs> Somebody, eh? Yeah, so I mean, I'll come tomorrow. <laughs> so we'll meet on Monday. Yeah. Yeah, so so four topics. I'll do at most six or seven, it's seven eh, on the course outline. I'll do six. And I'll give you the last one, I'll give it to you as an assignment to go ahead. Yes. And come and present. In a book form. Oh, we should put everything together as one. Oh, okay. Oh, it can easily be done. I'll do that. Uh, it can easily be done. So what will also happen is that. For each particular, each particular topic, we will have a case study, like a passage of a real life scenario. And one of those case studies would be what would, I would bring in the exam. So we we'll have like six case, case studies. You already have groups for your term paper. So the groups can just discuss the case study again, maybe after the lectures. And then in the exam, it will be, one of it will be composer. Okay. All right.
Thank you.